Let's go back to the start and to your home country of India and your home city of Mumbai or when you were growing up, Bombay. Bombay. What are your memories from childhood like? What kind of upbringing did you have? Oh, I, uh, I would say a uh, uh, warm family, uh, typical Goan Mangalorean family. My, I have a priest in the family. My father's two brothers are priests, my mother's uncle is a priest. There were priests in and out of the house always. And uh, we were, the parish was the center of our life. So you were very comfortable around the priesthood from an early very age? Very much, very much, yes. And what kind of things were you interested in as a young boy growing up in the hugely diverse city, excitement all around oh, you? What, yeah. were, what sparked I your interest? I remember that <clears throat> we got on so very well. One of the things struck me that even when I look back at my childhood days, the harmony among people of different religions, uh, which we, I don't think we were even conscious that we were of different religions. We were so friendly. We, did, we took it for granted that you would go to the temple, I'd go to the church, somebody else would go to the mosque. And we never thought twice about any difference among us. And uh, I was very interested in mathematics, science, and so then that was my uh, field of interest. And did you think of becoming a doctor someday or maybe yes, an engineer? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I wanted, uh, wanted to become a scientist really. Uh, somebody who did research and got into Sp Sputnik had just come back when I was in school. So we thought of space travel and rockets and that was our, like the, the big thing we talked about and so I wanted to get into that field. Wow. That, yeah. NASA was much known and Apollo was beginning. So, so that was, that was uh, the atmosphere that we grow in, that I grew up. So a very exciting time to be growing up and so many possibilities, the potentials exactly, exactly. were huge. But when did the idea then of a vocation or the priesthood first come into your mind? Uh, I guess the fact that there were so many priests in the family and so many priests visiting us and uh, important was we had a good parish priest and his example, his leadership, his service, uh, sort of he became like a role model and you wanted to be something like him. So all everything together, you can't say at what point of time what's triggered it off but uh, it, the idea came and the idea stuck. I went to college, went to the university to specialize in, uh, to, in to get into science and, and then the parish priest sent for my parents and said, he's wasting his time, please. But it sounds like it was, you made the decision of the transition with ease because if you were going for the vocation and the priesthood, you would be saying goodbye to any dreams you had of engineering or science or space or uh, marriage. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, I, I must tell you that being very honest, uh, I, I thought that I go, okay, I let, let me try it in that sense. Let me try it sort of because in the sense I not fully gave up the idea of really the, my, my love was science and physic, physics and mathematics, that was my love. And then, but then once I got into the seminary, I, I fitted in so well and I felt so comfortable. I felt it answered my needs and, and, and that gradually everything else faded off and Christ became important and the church became important, service became important and did you find it difficult at any stage because although you came from a solid foundation of a Catholic family, you know when young people are growing up they question things, they struggle with their faith and particularly because you were so interested in the world of science and mathematics where many people will say well those two cannot marry science and religion. So did you have any struggle within no, you? I, no, I, honestly, uh, what it forced me to maybe study theology more, to do more research, to discuss more. And, and the Vatican Council was happening soon after I joined. So that's what that was really, perhaps began to answer the question that was the right time. And if we skip forward, I mean, all the achievements that you had, all the councils you were a member of and you became uh, the Archbishop and then it was Pope Benedict who announced you as Cardinal. Was that a, a daunting announcement when you realized the responsibility that was now on your shoulders? Yes, you know, it was a big surprise and a bit of a shock. And I, I remember that it, uh, the Dancio rang up and said the Holy Father. And uh, of course it was going to be announced publicly after about a week or ten. And I, I, I didn't believe it in a way. So I rang the Dancio, I remember, the, and I said, are you sure there's no mistake? <laughs> I, I said, that I, I, I was at 62, I think. I said, that's not the age when they make cardinals, they make them at 70. I, I, I'm going to announce it to the press, is it okay? I remember I rang up the, the desk before the gone. I said, no, 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 please, go ahead. So it was a surprise, shock, and then gradually it dawned on me, yes. But what were the challenges that you were facing or the Catholics in India were facing? 
uh, it, when I took over, it was the idea really, I, I thought that the church had to become more vibrant. Uh, Bombay was a big, is a big, is a big diocese, was a big diocese always, uh, to make sure, with many priests, to animate the priests to work harder. And then uh, there were the beginnings of tension at that time. And I, I saw that was not good for the country, not good for the, for all of us, and not good for the Christian community, not good for the world also. And where we were an example of harmony and this should not be lost, I felt. After Pope Benedict, of course, Pope Francis, when he was elected in 2013, I think only a month after he was in his position that he announced that you would be one of the members of this Council of Cardinal Advisors where you would advise Pope Francis on issues around the governance of the church and reform as, as well. Was, was that a, a difficult task to go in and try and advise the Pope on reforming the church when there were so many people at that time calling out for reform? Yes, you know, there was a big call for reform and I, and I was you know, five times a year we come for three days uh, at a stretch and meet with the Holy Father, the, the nine of us, now we are six of us. But the Pope every now and then also has got his own points to ask us about and he said, I would like you to tell me on this and this and this. So every now and then, every meeting practically, he brings some point which he wants us to tell him about. And, and he participates just like one member. He puts up his hand and he says, I want to speak, ask this. And when you're talking to the Pope, even one-on-one, -on -one, and you're talking about reform and you're advising him and you're talking about different issues, what is at the forefront of Pope Francis's mind when he's thinking of reform in the church? Yeah, sort of, uh, he really wants to uh, see what's best for the church. I mean, he does it without us passionately. Uh, he uh, sort of has an objective to reform the Korea and going ahead. Uh, the, he knows there's ob uh, the, there would be obstacles in the way. And uh, we, but uh, right now, of course, the thing is uh, how to make it effective. We saw this week the news from the Vatican Bank and the question marks around a lot of the transactions yeah. going over the years. When you look at that, do you think that that kind of corruption in the Vatican can be weeded out? Yeah, you know, uh, now about this particular thing, also, uh, I, I, I have spoken to a few, those involved in it. It seems to me, first of all, uh, exaggerated and misunderstood. This is what I, I'm not defending anything. A man misunderstood what happened. And uh, I believe that, I mean, I've been told there's an explanation for everything which would indicate that everything is about both. But I, I mean, I'm waiting, I, don't, I don't know the details. Uh, and, uh, but we should really, I, I think it can be. Uh, there was lack of supervision perhaps before, but more communication, less secrecy, and uh, more checks and balances, transparency, accountability, that's so important. Now. And I think we must get that back into every system in the church. When you look at the Catholic Church today, and let's say when you became an advisor with Pope Francis back in 2013, I mean, it's not a long period of time, no, but it's fine. at the same time, you know, a lot has changed uh, in the church and Pope Francis has just brought a, around a lot of changes, even with how the church is perceived. How do you think the church has changed over those years around the world? Uh, I think people are aware, uh, I think he's given us assurance, a guarantee that there's not going to be no, no cover-ups. I'm not saying they were before, but there's no cover-ups. And uh, no one will be protected because uh, if anybody's done something wrong, he's got to pay the price, he's got to uh, answer the question, the right questions. Let's talk about the Synod. Yeah. Because here we are sitting in Rome just at the end of this four-week Synod. What did you think about how the indigenous people were treated when they were here in Rome? I know there was some controversy around the statues and what they represented and what they didn't represent, and then someone threw them into the river. I mean, when you see that news happening around the Synod, how, how does it make you feel? Yeah, oh, I, I mean, I, I was surprised. I mean, that people uh, with little knowledge, little understanding, uh, we overcome it and we go ahead. What do you think when you hear about that divide in the church? Because I was looking yeah. at Twitter and Facebook and when they were talking about these indigenous statues and some faithful Catholics were saying they have no place in the Vatican Gardens, they shouldn't be central to this. and. They were calling the people heroes who dumped them in the river. And then on the other side, you had other Catholics who were saying, no, you know, we, this isn't what Pope Francis is calling for. We should be united. This is, again, uh, something which, which is a sign that the church is alive. Um, the, 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 I, I, I fully appreciate and understand why people, are, that's why I said, 
some people will be upset because they don't know the full theological background, what Vatican II says. Uh, people are upset about Italy's dialogue. People are upset about, uh, they feel you're compromising when you talk to uh, people of other religions when I, when I have. And so there's been criticism of that also. But uh, you see, we've got to, the world has moved ahead. Theology has made progress. Our own understanding of other religions made progress. And uh, there's so many, uh, the Vatican Council has said there are, uh, there are good things in every religion, for example. No? And therefore we learn from them also. Now that would be a scandalous statement to say that we learn from other religions, but we learn from other. But it is true, uh, people improve their spirituality, their theology, their understanding by dialoguing. Now, so what I'm saying is that this is something because understandable with people who do not, have not reflected enough, understood enough, and uh, there should be more communication, more education, more reflection, and more trust. The final document has been put together. They're voting on it this weekend, and then it will be announced. In that final document, which will go forward to Pope Francis with suggestions on how to help and serve better the Catholic community in the Amazon region, what parts of that do you think are very good from the document you've seen? I think uh, what's strong and clear is the cry of the indigenous people who are being exploited, who are being taken advantage of. But that's come out strong and clear. There's lots of proposals in it yeah. in different ways they can try and alleviate the problem of the shortage of priests and so yeah, on. But yeah. one of them being the ordination of married, married men, men, some in favour, some not. Yes. Would that be something that you would be? Yes, I would of? be because, because uh, uh, I think that the present canon law does make uh, provision for this, the sense that it says it's an impediment if you have a wife to, be, to receive orders, but it's an impediment which can be dissolved by, dispensed by the Holy See. And it has been dispensed of, but uh, I think there should be very clear criteria, conditions put. Uh, it should not be a one man's decision, the whole conference must decide. I, I think certainly there is a way forward without uh, celibacy so important and has to be retained. I think it's got to be preserved and protected and reinforced. But then there certainly are cases where you can give a dispensation. And that dispensation, could that be applied in other parts of the world? Like, let's say, your home country of India, where... No, I, I mean, that's what I was saying. That's, why I, that, that's the reason why exactly why I said this should be a decision of the conference. The whole country must decide. And the Holy See, which gives the dispensation, must be convinced that the reasons given by the country are adequate. And then the application should be not from one bishop, but from a group of bishops, a province. And can you understand, again, when I was reading on social media, you know, people are, are fearful that it's going to take away centuries of church teaching no, and culture. No. And when we had so many uh, Anglican married pastors coming into the church, uh, the Pope Benedict allowed, we gave a dispensation to get them to have them ordained in the Catholic Church. A and we found a way, a modus vivendi, and it, it, it's working in certain ways. Therefore, you must be aware of the challenges, the dangers, and make sure it's a very select uh, area where you're applying this. I, I think very clearly the bishops of Africa would say that this would not, we don't need this. In India, I would say we don't need this. And I, I think in Europe also it's a different reason. But here it's when they receive the sacrament once, in, once a year, once in, twice a year, that's all. And then and we, there is a real need and then we can, temp, a temporary solution for a, we hope, a temporary problem. I know you've spoke as well about the role of women in the church yes, too. You, yes. you were saying that you could see them as having a more too much, too much. managerial could, role in the absolutely, parishes. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, we, we, that's why I'm saying, uh, if we, there were only a group of theologians, canoners, scripture scholars who studied together, we would find so much for Women are doing so much and uh, there's not sufficient recognition. They could even be in charge of a parish community with a priest. So that's allowed by canon law. When you look at the document, do you think that there is um, a likelihood that Pope Francis will enact some of the, the recommendations in it? Uh, I, I think uh, looking at his, uh, how he has treated other synods, without doubt he'll take this document very seriously. But this, doc this document is important uh, for what, it should not tie the Pope's hands, it should not push him too much. That, 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 so that, that's, uh, I think the drafters should be careful. Uh, I was involved in the drafting of the family documents, and so, I, so I know exactly how much we struggle. And so, so the Pope is free, and I'm, I'm sure he will, he will quote a lot and take off from here.
Finally, Cardinal, your life has played out across your city, across your country, but all over the world as well. The last time we met, it was on the border with North Korea, yes. standing on the South yes, Korean yes. side, when you were there for a conference about the unification of North and South Korea. So you have seen so many aspects of the church all over the world, um, your role as a priest, as an archbishop, and now as a cardinal. Do you still have a passion for what you do? Yes, very much, very much. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps the, the passion is getting stronger. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, it's, yes, it's, uh, I, I feel there's so much to be done and then the church, the, the church has got a role to play everywhere. Christ must be proclaimed everywhere. I really have a passion for uh, reconciliation, for peace, for unity, for, for harmony among peoples. I really do. I, 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 I don't think it's, uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's getting uh, warmer. And what would your hopes and dreams be for your church in your home city of Mumbai and your home country of India? No, I, I know the church which is fulfilling its role, church which is confident, church is, knows what it has got to do, the church which is doing what it should do. The church is, uh, is 2000 or 2000 years old and it has had problems at the very beginning and therefore, therefore I would like the church and to be vibrant, to really make a difference in the lives of the Catholics, Christians and all, all religions and the country, to be at the service of the country. Well, Your Eminence, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for your thank time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.